Around 500 BCE, Heraclitus wrote that no man ever steps into the same river twice. Both the river and the man will have changed. It is recognized that change is the only constant. Evolution is change over time, so evolution is a fact as obvious as gravity. Theories of evolution, on the other hand, attempt to explain the origin of novel forms of life. Since Charles Darwin published On the Origin of Species in 1859, there has been a Darwinian theory of evolution that has informed geographers, the other sciences, social sciences, literature, the arts, and Western culture in general. These ideas can be summed up in the words of Herbert Spencer, Survival of the Fittest. So our creatures have been misbehaving. You haven't yet isolated the boat. That's so unlike you, Bernard. It's the code you added, sir. The, the reveries. It has some... Uh... Mistakes. Is the word you're too embarrassed to use. You ought not to be a product of a trillion of them. The evolution forged the entirety of sentient life on this planet using only one tool. The mistake. For more than 60 years, biologists have been beguiled by the idea of mistakes and molecules, specifically molecules of DNA and RNA, leading to a dark, gene-determined vision of life. To quote Richard Dawkins from The Selfish Gene, We are survival machines, robot vehicles blindly programmed to preserve the selfish molecules known as genes. Unquote. In his 2017 book, Dance to the Tune of Life, Biological Relativity, Oxford physiologist and systems biologist Dennis Noble disputes this, quote, Recent experimental work in biological science has deconstructed the ideas of a gene. Genes are passive, not active causes, unquote. A new paradigm, biological relativity, is emerging. It is a conceptual change from a reductionist view of static things to a system's view of dynamic processes. Noble points out that when physicists invaded biology in the 1940s and 50s, they forgot relativity. Quote, Biological relativity is simply that there is no privileged level of causation in biology. Living organisms are multi-level open stochastic systems in which the behavior at any level depends on the higher and lower levels and cannot be fully understood in isolation. Just as special relativity and general relativity can be succinctly phrased as saying that there is no global, that is, privileged, frame of reference, biological relativity can be phrased as saying there is no global frame of causality in organisms, unquote. Since 1983, when Barbara McClintock won the Nobel Prize for her discovery of transposable elements in the genomes of maize, biology has been on notice that the nucleus is a dynamic organelle of the cell. Further research has shown that in response to environmental stress, organisms can perform their own natural genetic engineering. Flagella allow bacteria to swim. In this study by Taylor, Mully, Dills, et al., bacteria engineered to lack flagella were faced with starvation. The bacteria responded by re-evolving flagella in just four days. The authors of the study shoehorn their results into a modern synthetic vocabulary but they give no explanation for the normal rate of mutation being sped up by three orders of magnitude. No explanation is offered for how random mutations become repeatable mutational steps. Starvation is presented as a selection pressure, but there is no explanation for how or where natural selection takes place in the process. The authors do stipulate that the resurrection of flagella is based in the non-Darwinian processes of gene duplication and horizontal gene transfer. Noble offers a systems explanation based in biological relativity. The bacteria harness Brownian motion and use it to hypermutate targeted DNA at specific loci relevant to the missing flagella, while maintaining the rest of the genome intact. The bacterium does its own natural genetic engineering to run tens to hundreds of thousands of experiments to enable a different pathway to be used to resurrect its flagella. The normal mutation rate is like a geyser, 
compared to the volcanic eruption of hypermutation. The bacteria re-evolve flagella using the regulatory biochemical networks, a level above the genome of the cell. In doing this, they have acquired a character that is then transmitted down from bacterium to bacterium like standard genetic inheritance. Is this a demonstration of both Lamarckism and teleology? Yes. In our hubris, we've named a geological epoch after ourselves. The Anthropocene is a period of time starting with the invention of the steam engine. The Anthropocene is claimed to mark the end of nature, nature being the stable, non-human background to human history. Nature is now supposedly embedded in the man-made. Geographers beginning in 1800 with Alexander von Humboldt have warned repeatedly about our destructive impact on the planet, leading to anthropogenic climate change. We delude ourselves that we are the dominant influence on the planet. Have we sufficiently conceived of either the temporal or spatial scales upon which evolution takes place? Have we accepted that there are many levels of organization in nature? Have we appreciated the integral roles that deep time, earth as an open system, the microcosmos, and cycles of extinction play in shaping the evolution of life on earth? As humans, we share a species-specific arrogance. Implicitly, most of us believe that our species is the standard by which all other life, extinct or living, is measured, and that the single greatest division of life on earth is between us and everything else. Contradicting our assumed exceptionalism, it is a difference in cell type that is in fact the single greatest division of life on earth. The vast majority of life is either bacteria, organisms without nuclei, called prokaryotes, or protists, single-celled organisms with nuclei and other organelles, eukaryotes. Let's look for a moment at deep or geologic time. Our Anthropocene is the pavement under the pickup truck. The Holocene in yellow is the past 10,000 years. Animals have only been around for 570 million years. The origin of life was some 3,800 million years ago, and for the first 2,000 million years of life on Earth, there were only bacteria. During that time, bacteria evolved all the essential miniaturized chemical systems, the entire repertoire of metabolism, fermentation, nitrogen fixation, and five different kinds of carbon dioxide assimilation. We live on a bacterial world, Bacteria have run the earth and changed it in fundamental ways since the beginning. They changed the atmosphere of earth from one largely composed of carbon dioxide to an atmosphere that is largely nitrogen and oxygen. They oxidized all of the abundant iron in solution in the oceans. Bacteria have radically changed the crust of the earth. On the ancient earth at the end of the Hadean eon some 4,000 million years ago, the crust contained an estimated 1,400 types of minerals. Today, through the biogeochemistry of bacteria, the number of minerals in the crust has grown to 4,300. Most, if not all, the great ore deposits on the planet were accumulated through bacterial metabolism. From a biospheric perspective, it is the bacteria, the primary producers, in particular the cyanobacteria, which are the life support system of all other life on Earth. As humans, where do we fit in? Our human cells are in the minority even within our own bodies. Our persistent microbial symbionts, predominantly bacteria, make up from 50 to 90 percent of who we are. My eukaryotic body and its persistent microbial communities is now termed a hollow biont. We are not individuals by any anatomical, physiological, developmental, immune, genetic, or evolutionary sense. We are teams or communities of organisms. We are niches constructed by bacteria. We humans are also the bacterial space program. Bacteria landed on the moon with Neil Armstrong. They've beaten us to Mars, having hitched rides on our landers and rovers. Our role on the planet is the extraction and recycling of sequestered carbon and ores. 
We use oceans of water and mountains of calcium oxide to build immense structures. We've been instrumental in making bacteria resistant to most antibacterial agents. Our burgeoning numbers have led to deforestation, desertification, destruction of wild habitats, a sixth mass extinction, and the destabilization of the climate. But consider this, that despite our best efforts, there is an estimated trillion species, mostly microbes, currently inhabiting Earth. Life on Earth is radically interdependent and continues to evolve into highly integrated communities. These communities exist in the trillions of trillions in the microcosmos, and those microbial communities nest inside fewer larger microbiomes as scales increase through niches, habitats, ecosystems, 882 ecozones, 14 biomes to one biosphere. Bacteria are the active agents in the self-organized Earth system, described by James Lovelock's Gaia theory. Gaia theory states, over a trillion types of extant organisms, descendant from common ancestors and embedded in the biosphere, that directly and indirectly interact with one another and with the environment's chemical constituents, form a homeoretic biotic planetary regulatory system within physical limits. They produce and remove gases, ions, metals, and organic compounds through their metabolism, growth, and reproduction. These interactions in aqueous solution led to the modulation of the Earth's surface temperature, acidity alkalinity, the pH, and the chemically reactive gases of the atmosphere and hydrosphere. Mass extinction events put an interesting twist on the idea of survival of the fittest and may hold a clue to our own fate as a species. The late micropaleontologist Martin Brazier, an expert on single-celled ocean protists called Foraminifera, or Forams for short, found that the fossil record of their shells revealed that they have repeatedly evolved larger, elaborate species that housed photosynthesizing algal, diatom, or dinoflagellate symbionts over the millions of years between extinction events. To quote Brazier, using the same rules for tracing the evolution of 4M symbioses through deep time, we can discover that these great cycles from calamity to calm and back to calamity again have taken place numerous times over the last 300 million years. Not only that, but they have always followed the same tragic trajectory. They have always resulted in the total collapse of symbiotic forms. It is an alarming pattern. Indeed, it is so regular, it is almost a prophecy." Unquote. Brazier noted that in this pattern there is nagging evidence that extinctions do not neatly coincide with the arrival of an asteroid, a volcanic eruption, or some other presumed cause. Instead, the cause is what Brazier called the Sphinx within. Quote, In the case of ecosystems, long periods of stability and hence of predictable conditions encourage ever greater efficiency and specialization, perhaps to the point where there is almost no slack left in the system. Every resource is shared and channeled, and the system is exquisitely dependent upon this finely tuned state. But when conditions change, there is nowhere left to run, meaning that the specialists become extinct. Maximum efficiency proves fatal. Looked at in this way, it may be unsafe to say that Darwinian natural selection of species is truly about survival of the fittest, that is, if we take fittest to mean the most efficient. So in the fullness of time, catastrophic collapse within any complex and highly structured system seems an almost inevitable outcome, including extinctions of both cellular organisms and human societies." Unquote. We have destabilized only that level of nature in which we ourselves are embedded.